was not gone over, and that is, what is a supernova? And uh, I'm going to play this video by Mr. Thornhill and another one after it by Mr. Talbot. And then I'm going to give some closing thoughts and we can move on from the sun. But I strongly recommend watching the videos that are attached down in the description because you can't get the full story from me. I'm just trying to point it out, the connection between the past cataclysms and the universe are very important because when you make that connection, you can just put it all together. And when you watch anything in ancient history, this puts it in a completely different context. And you know about everything that has gone down the way that I think it has through the electric universe and the purple dawn of creation, it paints a completely different picture. I know that it's the urge to personify is great and there may very well have been beings or a higher civilization. I have no doubt in that there was something going on there, but this paints a totally different picture of what was going on in the solar system. I really recommend watching these videos and any of the Electric Universe videos that I have in my playlist, if this topic interests you.
is in an old elliptical galaxy in a region where there are no stars being born. So this raises some questions at the end of the article. It says, is this a runaway star from another star formation site? Is it a very local bit of star formation? Is it a different way for such a supernova to occur? None of these seems very likely, so we have a real puzzle. Well, the problem stems from the theory of stars themselves. In fact, the models of stars are so complex that they are non-predictive. One wag suggested you could just as easily come up with a koala bear as a star from the complexity of the theory. The other thing is that a supernova explosion is not really understood. It's a very clever model, but it's totally beyond belief. You have a star which suddenly switches off a theoretical engine at the centre, its nuclear furnace, and it suddenly implodes. So this requires the uh, switch off to be sudden. And not only that, the implosion then has to rebound to form the explosion. Of course, this kind of model you would expect would form a spherical shell of material racing away from the star. But what do we see when we look at supernovae? Generally, they have an axis along which matter is ejected. So it's not spherical, the explosion. So this is another puzzle. In fact, it was June last year, it was reported that supercomputer models of supernovae failed to explode. All they did was to implode and collapse. So it's not surprising that astronomers are puzzled. This particular supernova shows a high degree of helium, which also is unexpected. So it was even suggested that perhaps this particular supernova was another type, which is due to white dwarfs exceeding a certain mass and then exploding. And so they said maybe it was a collision of two white dwarfs, one of which was helium rich. So you can see these special conditions that are being introduced in order to try and explain this supernova. Now, it's just a couple of years ago that I had published in the IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science my explanation of Supernova 1987A, which shows structure. It showed three rings which were centred on an axis through the star, and these rings were made of bright beads. The one nearest the star, encircling where the star was, were very bright, and those further away were dimmer. But th this kind of structure is just not explained by any theory of an exploding star. Much of the strange and encumbered reasoning behind the standard supernova theory may be resolved if a supernova is reinterpreted as an electrical discharge. In the electric universe model of stars, the complex chemistry to produce the heavy elements inside the star is unnecessary in a supernova. The idea is, of course, that there are populations of stars, and the first population of stars exploded and threw all of the heavier elements out into space where they were collected to make the second population of stars. Now, this is a very messy and inefficient way of producing the stars that we see in our own galaxy, for instance. Also, wherever you look, astronomers are finding anomalies in chemical compositions of stars, stars that shouldn't be there, that they're the wrong age, the wrong population. Recently, looking at globular clusters, they've been puzzled by the chemical composition of those stars because it was thought they must have all been produced at the same time in the same event, and yet they're finding compositions which don't fit that picture. In the electric universe, all stars produce heavy elements at their surface, in their photospheres, where strong electrical discharge activity is taking place. And of course, on Earth in the laboratory, this is exactly the way we produce isotopes and heavier elements in the laboratory is by electric power uh, applied to accelerators. So there's nothing mysterious there. The standard model, on the other hand, requires purely theoretical and untestable things to be going on unseen inside stars. When it comes to uh, star exploding, the electrical model is simplicity itself, and it doesn't require the star to be of any particular age because in the electrical model, of course, Electrical power is supplied to all stars and is the source of their light and heat and the radiation from them. Now, Hans Alfain pointed out that the circuits in space also include what are called double layers, where charge is separated across a very small region of space. Those double layers can act like a switch, and if that switch is thrown, then the circuit is broken and all of the energy stored in the magnetic fields of that circuit, which can extend far beyond the star into the galaxy itself, 
is concentrated on that double layer, that switch. And that switch can actually be at the surface of a star. So a supernova explosion is purely an electrical explosion. It's the kind of thing that has been photographed and you can see on YouTube when high voltage transmission power lines, the circuit is opened at the, an inappropriate time and a huge arc stretches between the two electrodes as they separate. So you could say that what you're looking at in a supernova explosion is the opening of a stellar switch when that star suddenly brightens to the point where it can outshine all of the rest of the stars in that galaxy. For continuous news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info. The most critical test of the electric comet came on July 4, 2005. That was when NASA's Deep Impact probe fired an 800-pound copper projectile at the nucleus of Comet Temple 1. Cameras on the probe recorded the event, and even the projectile itself contained a camera to transmit data up to the moment of impact. As early as 2001, looking ahead to this event, electrical theorist Wallace Thornhill began anticipating the surprises in store for comet science. On the evening of July 3rd, 2005, the day before the encounter, the Thunderbolts website published the predictions of Thornhill and his colleagues. These predictions would clearly contrast the standard and the electric comet models. As the Deep Impact probe approached Temple 1, key NASA figures gathered in the control room. The comet was racing toward the probe at some 23,000 miles per hour when the probe launched its copper impactor toward the nucleus. If the comet was electrically charged, how would the electronics of the impactor respond to the electric field? Through most of its journey, the impactor's signal was clear, but in the final seconds, the signal was indeed disrupted. This apparent electrical disturbance was not all that Thornhill predicted. He also anticipated an advanced flash ahead of the projectile's impact, a uniquely electrical event. This is exactly what occurred. And the advanced flash left NASA scientists scratching their heads. NASA investigators were well aware of the kinetics of impact explosions. But would the projectile be striking a solid icy surface or a more loose aggregation of snowy fluff? They did not consider the electrical energy of the comet, but Thornhill had long predicted the explosion would be greater than any NASA scientist envisioned. It seems that the spectacular explosion that followed the impact was the greatest surprise. Every scientist viewing the live images expressed his astonishment.
The scientists had expected to peer into a deep hole in a cometary dirty snowball before the deep impact vehicle was too far away. But the erupting cloud of silicate dust was so thick and the explosion so sustained that it completely obscured Comets, the local terrain. No detection of Temple 1 subsurface ice was ever reported. Nevertheless, mission scientists tell us that infrared readings did detect substantial water ice in the ejecta cloud. The Enigma deserves investigation. What happened at the surface and below the surface at the moment of impact? Most NASA scientists interpreted the fast-moving cloud as vaporized silicates. The cloud was self-luminous at an estimated 1,000 to 2,000 degrees Kelvin, and the low angle of the impact and blast propelled the ejecta downrange. The infrared readings of the ejecta occurred about three seconds after impact, as the cloud came into the view of the infrared camera. These readings show what NASA scientists describe as a narrow beam of water. This water column was easily distinguished from the rapidly moving dust cloud and was very close to vertical directly over the impact site. That's a bizarre contrast to the trajectory of the dust cloud. How did a vertical column of water get instantaneously separated from an explosion of dust heated to over 1,000 degrees and propelled downrange? The electric comet model offers an answer. The heated silicate cloud would be ionized, a plasma, a conductive pathway for an explosive electric discharge. The evidence indicates the discharge occurred between a negatively charged nucleus and a surrounding region of positive charge. An abundance of hydrogen ions gathered at or close to the surface of the nucleus would provide the necessary conditions for two things. First, an instantaneous electrical breakdown or discharge on impact and second, an equally instantaneous electrochemical response to the discharge. Consider what is already known from laboratory experiments. In a condition of electrical breakdown, hydrogen ions from the solar wind, combining with the oxygen in silicates, can produce an abundance of hydroxyl and or water. This very process has been proposed to explain the enigmatic water on the planet Mercury. According to the popular model, it's the pressurized gases of volatiles beneath the surface that explain the impressive velocities of cometary jets. As a last resort in the search for water on Temple 1, NASA scientists hoped to identify the vents for its jets. The vents were never found. When viewed through the lens of standard theory, some predictions of the electric model could only appear absurd. Thornhill anticipated that the locations of the comet jets could actually shift as charge redistribution occurred on the nucleus after a significant electrical event. Confirmation of this prediction came from the Nordic Optical Telescope in La Palma, Spain. As released by the observatory, two images of the comet before impact and hours later tell the story emphatically. Fifteen hours after the blast, new jets appeared far from the location of the impact itself.
The Deep Impact mission promised to give us the best images ever of a comet nucleus. On the eve of the impact, the Thunderbolts group stated the electrically predicted surface features in no uncertain terms. The surface of Temple One astonished the experts. Expansive mesas and steep vertical ridges did not belong on a comet, and the presence of craters sparked a debate that continues today. Fortunately, scientists had an opportunity for a second look at Temple One. After the Stardust mission to Comet Vilt 2, that probe was redirected to the object of the Deep Impact mission. Stardust was then renamed NEXT, or New Exploration of Temple One. It would give additional views of the comet's surface. With the arrival of the next probe, old mysteries only grew more perplexing, leaving scientists to debate the contradictions of theory. Even the scalloping of mesa walls and nearly vertical ridges, something we've mentioned so often in connection with electric discharge machining, was duly noted by NASA scientists. At least 60 craters were counted, though collisions along the comet's path would be exceedingly rare if occurring at all, and the surfaces of active comets are rapidly eroded, far too rapidly to preserve a record of rare impacts across geologic timescales. In fact, most astronomers now reject explanation by impact, and that includes Michael Ahern, the principal investigator of the Deep Impact mission. What then was responsible for the pervasive cratering of the Temple One surface? Laboratory experiments have shown that entire fields of craters are readily produced by electric arcs to a negatively charged surface. Nothing observed on cometary nuclei has contradicted the electrical interpretation. Here is the most fundamental question one could ask about active comets. Is electric arcing occurring at the surface? If so, should we not see this arcing where there is sufficient camera resolution? We have a good example in the energetic plumes of Jupiter's moon Io, where the sensors of the Galileo probe were saturated by apparent electric arcs, producing blotches of whiteout. A second example came with the Stardust mission and the appearance of small saturation points on the surface of Comet Vilt 2, but with insufficient resolution to make a definitive case for what the electrical theorists suspected. The enigmatic whiteouts on the active surface of Temple 1 were everything the electrical theorists could have asked for, and the most prominent were placed exactly where the electric model envisions them eroding the cliffs of mesa walls and extending the floors of numerous craters and depressions. Fortunately, the swift satellite provided a view of the comet explosion not just in visible light, but in ultraviolet wavelengths, which often give the best pointers to electrical events. The ultraviolet emissions required temperatures of over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 
The temperatures of the blast will explain why the initial eruption saturated the sensors on the Deep Impact probe. Calculations based on pixel saturation indicated a minimum initial temperature of the flash at almost 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Though saturation means the temperature could have been much higher. The first purpose of the Deep Impact mission was to excavate the envisioned subsurface water ice. But electrical theorists have consistently predicted little or no water on most comet nuclei. Nothing approaching the expected levels of water was detected in the exploding cloud. A lack or absence of volatiles can only mean that something is fundamentally wrong in standard comet theory. Comets are supposed to be dirty snowballs. That's what they still teach in school. That don't look like no dirty snowball to me. That's an awful rocky looking snowball. And if it was a snowball, how long would it last when it reached close to the sun? Seriously, it's just amazing that Mr. Thornhill made this prediction in 2001. That was 16 years ago, and have we ever heard anything about it? I didn't. I don't think any news channel carried it. I didn't even know that there was such a thing as an electric universe. Two years ago, when I stumbled on it, and it wasn't easy to find, until one day that I searched electricity in space, often wondered where does electricity come from and does it have a main source and here mr thornhill makes this prediction of what's going to happen when this 800 pound copper probe hit this comet and everything he predicted came true but yet the nasa scientists were scratching their heads and uh, it, they predicted it was just going to be collision and a bunch of ice or debris would come out and it would leave a giant crater. In other words, that it was just going to be kinetic. It wasn't going to be uh, any electrical or anything like that. And yet, they used copper, which is the most conductive metal for electricity. So that's kind of a, an enigma there. I mean, they could have used something cheaper than copper. It's kind of strange. It, it almost gives a sign that they really know, but they're keeping it from the plebes. But I can't prove that. Kudos to Mr. Thornhill for uh, just being right. As a matter of fact, since I've been studying this subject, I don't think he's been wrong about one thing yet. And that just signifies even more that mainstream has gone astray. And for them to remain obtuse to the whole electric universe is just, just ridiculous in my, from my perspective. First, imagine where this world would be if we didn't have electricity, if there were no electricity. I think uh, Nikola Tesla knew this, among many other things. I think he is one of the greatest geniuses that the human race has ever produced. I have always thought, why did they not teach us about Tesla in school? I think the first time I ever heard the name was from a rock group from the 80s. And then it slowly but surely unraveled as to who he really was. Why was he cast as the evil scientist in Superman comics? The genius of Tesla is that he took the schematics from nature 
and brought it to earth in the form of alternating current. I think that's just amazingly genius. He was trying to prevent wars with his inventions, but he knew that humans would twist them into being able to create wars with them. And, you know, a lot of his stuff was plundered. For all we know, they could be using his inventions right now. I mean, we're still using the alternating current system that he devised. Rockets going into space. And, and, you know, NASA is not doing space anymore. Well, who is? When was the last time you ever heard of a scientist who worked for the benefit of mankind? We're still running on early 1900s technology. But the whole idea of a paradigm even existing is just moronic and all that really serves to do is shackle investigation which is the case in every single science truth be told the whole uniformitarian paradigm exists and has existed for only one reason to hide the truth for reasons unknown the major sciences are seemingly in collusion. The Royal Society governs everything. The rabbit hole goes so deep there's no telling where it leads to. But it is refreshing that they are all being challenged. My oldest son coined a term. He calls it confabulational subterfuge. I think that's pretty good. One has to just research and grow on their own at this point. Teach our kids to have an open mind and do not accept the teachings of authority as truth. Do your own research and draw your conclusions. But in the meantime, you have to just play their game to be able to get the credentials you need in life. How did things get so messed up and why? That is one of the reasons I love baseball so much. Because when you're between the lines, it's true. There's no lying and no paradigms. Why intelligent human beings would allow themselves to be marginalized by a paradigm is just beyond me. That just, I don't know, it just defeats the whole purpose of science. You know, we're never going to grow if we just keep this paradigm in the way. That's like building a brick wall between you and the place you want to be. Uniformitarianism is the biggest lie ever perpetrated on the people of the world. I don't know, maybe it's all so that they can put on a suit every day and go to work and get a paycheck. Millions of dollars are given to people who follow the paradigm and nothing is given to people who don't. Well, that says it all right there. But there's a growing number of people that want to know the truth. Our history is not what we've been taught. And this world is not four and a half billion years old. I think that's pretty clear. So all we can really do is just keep trying to research the truth and find out for ourselves. At this point, the people that sit on the top, the gatekeepers of mainstream science, they are not intellectually moral they have no integrity they sold it and that is sad come to think of it we still live like we did in 1975 the only difference is now we have the internet it's a wonder to me that it's even allowed but at least we still have the ability to freely discuss these things that hasn't been taken away from us and that's a good thing. It just might start a revolution in science. I hope so. The changes that would come from it are just, it boggles the mind. Everything would have to be replaced and changed. And that might be a major reason why it's not. Then of course there's the question of what would happen to religion. 
And that's a big what if. Mainstream. It's just, it knows no bounds and it has no end. Hopefully one day, the paradigm will change. But it has begun. And the early 21st century just might be a period of history known as the beginning of the revolution in science. That the sons have to rise up to kill, creating primal guilt, the original sin. But perhaps Freud was on to the subject but not got it quite correct. Perhaps it was the father, the Atlantean fathers, that caused the psychosis. And in fact, if we look at our human fears and phobias, it might make more sense to think of them rather as psychological phobias and fears, but that their origin may be physiological. For why is it that we're scared of thunder and lightning? and of darkness and caves and hollow places. We have fear of water, we have fear of heights, of loneliness, of insects and certain other animals, and of unclosed spaces, and even paranoia against foreigners. And it's always put down to us by the psychologists that these are psychological fears, they just came about. So a man's fear of the ocean, that deep fear, that just came about psychologically. What? From a homo sapien that's meant to have existed on the planet with oceans for perhaps millennia? Why would you have such an irrational fear? But wouldn't you have that fear if you racially encoded into your DNA, encoded into your racial memory, saw the whole earth torn apart, visited by unimaginable ravages, and it was in historical blink of the eye? Such events are written in our genetic memory, and that is the origin of all these fears and phobias. They are physiologically based, not psychological. It's like they all got together and said, okay, we're going to teach this here subject. And in order to be able to do it, we're all going to be on the same page and we got to have this, this, and this to put it in place. And thus uniformitarianism was born. And nobody can step outside of the paradigm. That, please. Your primitive intellect wouldn't understand alloys and compositions and things with molecular structures in the paradigm to me is like I if I'm 10 years old and I make a plan for my life that I have to stick to that plan to the letter even though I'm going to be learning so much more down the road and when I'm 35 I'm going to know a lot more than I knew when I was 10 but I still have to live by those rules that I set when I was 10. See it's it just, it's wacky. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, humans are so far above that. And yet, we have it. We're like the kids that got thrown in the basement. And we only get to know what they decide to tell us. That stinks. It really does. I mean, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Religion takes the spirit out of it. That just introduces dogma and rules. One doesn't need rules to be spiritual.